Hi, chemistry students. We're going to talk about the reaction quotient, which is a very interesting uh, concept in equilibrium chemistry and one which you need to master because it will help you solve many problems in the future. So let's start by looking at some data from some random uh, made up experimental data from this reaction here. Some gas A turns into gas B. We have two experiments, one and two, going on here. So let's focus on experiment one and understand what everything says here. We know from our definition of equilibrium that this reaction has certainly reached equilibrium at this point, at uh, somewhere between 1.8 and 2.0 seconds, because the concentrations are constant afterwards. So that's equilibrium. On the graph, to the right of this red line, we see that we've reached equilibrium for certain. Somewhere between 1.8 and 2, we did it, but here we can certainly say we're at equilibrium. But prior to that, we're not. All right? So it's important to realize there's a difference between those two, and the, and the process will behave differently before and after. Same thing for experiment two. We can see that starting with the different initial amounts, in this case starting with no reactants and all products, we get a different result. We end up with a different concentration of, of products and reactants when we reach equilibrium, and that happens at a different time. So uh, fortunately, this is the same reaction. We should get the same equilibrium constant no matter what we start with, because the equilibrium constant doesn't matter or doesn't care about what we start with, uh, just what the reaction is and what temperature we're at. So looking at the experimental data for number two, the graph over here, equilibrium on the right, and once again, not equilibrium on the left. So our goal is to kind of describe what are the, what's going on in, in the non-equilibrium area of these graphs or the data. How can we use that to predict which way we're going to move? I mean, let's say we don't have the ability to take all this data. What if we can only know what we're going to mix? What if we only know what the time equals zero concentrations are going to be? Can we predict which way the reactions will move? That's our goal for today. So to do this, we're going to start with experiment one, and we're going to, uh, we're going to look at this in a very systematic way. So first off, that yellow region that I, kind of, I, I have highlighted there, uh, we can say that these are the equilibrium concentrations, and so we can calculate the equilibrium constant. And I've added the subscript C here because these substances are gases, and there are other equilibrium constants, constants available to a gas, such as K sub P, and that'll be discussed in a different video or in the book or in lecture. So K sub C means we're doing the equilibrium concentration or doing the equilibrium constant in terms of concentrations. And when we do this calculation, we find that we have an equilibrium constant of 3.5. Now we're going to do the interesting thing. This is brand new, but what we're going to do is we're going to look at the conditions before we were at equilibrium, and we're going to look at the same exact ratio, the concentration of B divided by the concentration of A. No longer at equilibrium. This is previous to being at equilibrium. So we're going to look at this number and just see what, what, what we can gleam from just calculating it at every single point of the way. And we're going to call this ratio the reaction quotient and give it the symbol Q sub C. So this quantity is describing the same thing as the equilibrium constant, only it does it at any time, while the equilibrium constant itself is only applicable to when the system is at equilibrium. So let's do the calculations for each one of these from time 0 to time 1.8 seconds and put them now in a table right there. And lo and behold, what we can see is Q sub C starts off low, and it's zero, which is less than K sub C. And it keeps getting larger and larger and larger as we move down the table. As time goes on, it keeps increasing until it reaches K. What we just found out is when Q naught, the initial Q is less than K, the Q, the reaction will move in such a way so that Q increases. And it will stop moving in one direction over the other when Q is equal to K. So which way did this one move? Well, we started with 3.5 molar A. When we got done, there was 0.778. So we had a reduction in the concentration of A, and we had an increase in the concentration of B. This reaction shifted to the right. So we, just, we now know that if a reaction has an, a, a reaction quotient less than the equilibrium constant, it will shift to the right to reach equilibrium. Keep that in mind. Let's try the same thing with experiment two now. In experiment two, 
the equilibrium constant should be the same, but we should double check. Voila, where we have the exact same equilibrium constant. We're in good hands. So now let's look at our ratio again of Q. And if we look at this, we notice that the initial value, which is four divided by zero, is extremely large. We, we tend to call this infinity, though the mathematicians may argue with this. It doesn't matter because we're not gonna use this value to do anything else with. We just know that it's really large. And it's really large, and then it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until guess what? It finally becomes the same value as K. So this thing Q, which can have any value in the world, moves until it reaches the same value as K for the reaction. In this particular case, because K was less than the initial Q naught, the Q, the reaction quotient, will decrease by actions of the reaction, okay, by the shifting of the reaction in one direction or the other, until Q is equal to K. For this particular reaction, we had no reactant to begin with, and the reactants increased while the products decreased. So this means we were shifting to the left. We were taking some product and making reactants. All right, so when K is less than Q, we shift to the left. And we found in the earlier video, when Q is less than K, we shift to the right. Fantastic. Let's see if we can put this together in a problem that's brand spanking new and different, different uh, numbers in every way. So we've got some reaction, it's uh, 2x goes to 3y, and we're given an equilibrium constant. And we're asked, which way will this shift to reach equilibrium? Now it's possible, by the way, that it can already be at equilibrium, but in this particular case, it's not going to be. Uh, according to the initial data, the initial data, this is not equilibrium information, this is the concentrations of these chemicals when they were mixed. Okay, so when we did this, when we did the mixing, we had 0.86 molar, 0.86 molar of X and 0.38 molar of Y. So the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna calculate Q. And we find that Q is 0.00742 and that is larger than K. So when Q is larger than K, Q is gonna to have to decrease to end up equaling K. And the only way for Q to decrease, because it's got, because it's got products in the numerator and reactants in the denominator, the only way for this to get smaller is if we use up some of the, re or the, some of the products to make some reactants. In other words, we're gonna shift to the left. So this reaction shifts left to reach equilibrium, shifts towards, sh shifts towards reactants. So here's what you should take away from this short video. First off, Q is called the reaction quotient, and to calculate it, it has the exact same form as the equilibrium constant. It's measurable at any time, this value of Q, but the equilibrium constant only makes sense to discuss when we're at equilibrium. The reaction will shift either right or left to allow Q to change until it's equal to the equilibrium constant, and specifically, if Q is less than K, we shift to the right towards products, but if Q is greater than K, then we shift to the left towards reactants. And I can't stress this enough, watching this video a few times to make sure you understand what Q means, how it's used, will be very important because almost all equilibrium problems require the use of comparing Q to K at some point. Hope this helps you out.